Hi, my name is Tom Lynch. I'm the director of the Yale Cancer Center, and I join you today from Sarah Cannon. By 2020, cancer will be the leading cause of death in America. We've got to do better. We've got to come up with better treatments for patients and families that are going through this difficult disease. If we don't commit ourselves to finding new drugs and finding new answers, we won't make progress. And clinical trials are the way that we do that. For every new drug that's made a difference for patients and families in this country who have cancer, it started with a phase one clinical trial, which then progressed to a phase two and phase three clinical trial. Currently, only 3% of patients with cancer participate in clinical trials. We need to do better as a medical system. We need to do better to offer new treatments to patients who have cancer. If we don't do that, we won't make the progress that we need to. So clinical trials are available in a variety of settings around the country. You can go to an NCI-designated cancer center and find clinical trial options. You also can go to a research center, such as the Sarah Cannon Research Institute, where a wide variety of trials are available. But one of the great things that I think that we're seeing is an organization like Sarah Cannon is able to offer clinical trials to people close to home and close to their, uh, in, in their communities. So if you look at throughout the United States, particularly in the southeastern part of the United States, Sarah Cannon has done a remarkable job of being able to offer outstanding cutting edge clinical trials in the communities where patients live. There are lots of internet sources that one can use. Clinicaltrials.gov is a great source of information on clinical trials that could be available to patients in their communities. And other websites, such as the Mini Pearl Foundation website, has a clinical trials finder that's available with it that can be used by patients to find what clinical trials might be available in your community. I think it's important to understand what the risks and benefits of a given clinical trial are. What I've found as a, as a physician is the vast majority of patients will participate in clinical research when it's explained to them in a way that they can understand. The good news from a patient's perspective is that all of these trials have been reviewed by committees that look and weigh the relative risks versus the relative benefits for the overall trial participation. So we know that they are asking important questions and that we think that the trials are being done in a way to protect patient safety. But for the individual patient, each person has to weigh for themselves the relative risks and benefits of participating in a trial. The consent form is one good way uh, to learn that. The physician, the doctor taking care of you, is another person to say, hey doctor, what do you think the potential benefits of this are and what are the potential risks? And then one other source that I think is incredibly important is the, are the research staff, the data coordinator, the study nurse, the people taking care of you. They've seen other patients, in most cases, go through a trial. They understand what it's like and asking them to give you some background can also be very helpful. Well, I think the biggest misconception surrounding clinical trials is the idea that um, you'll be given something you don't know about, okay, or that you'll be a guinea pig in, in a trial. I, I hear that from patients. I don't want to be a guinea pig. So I think a couple things are important to say. Number one is that there will be no placebos used in a clinical trial unless it specifically says that in the consent form. We do use placebos occasionally in clinical trials, but the only time we use those are when a patient knows that there's a chance they may get a placebo. So I can't tell you how many patients have said to me, Dr. Lynch, how do I know I'm not getting a placebo when there was never a placebo in the consent form? So if the consent form does not mention a placebo, there are no placebos in the, in the clinical trial. I think that's a huge issue um, uh, for patients to, to be assured. Then the other question is, is this question about being, and I hate to use the expression even, guinea pig. Um, what does that mean? And I think it's important to know that an idea doesn't get to be a clinical trial without a tremendous amount of pre-clinical work, work in cell lines, work in animal systems, to look at safety and look at potential effectiveness of a compound or a combination of drugs. And so I, I really think that as much risk as possible is taken out of the equation before a patient is offered a clinical trial. But it doesn't underestimate, the, it doesn't uh, undermine the fact that 
when you take a clinical trial, you are doing something that's a little bit unknown or it wouldn't be a clinical trial. And so a patient needs to be informed of the various risks or benefits for the individual patient. And my experience has been when you do that, most patients want to do it. They want to do it because they want to help themselves and they want to do it because I think as Americans, we want to help other people too. We want to help the person who's going to be sitting in this chair five years from now to be able to make a better decision. Just like the people who sat in this chair five years ago help us make better decisions. Today's treatments are yesterday's clinical trials. When you think about some of the advances in cancer, a great example is how we approach breast cancer. And breast cancer is a very common problem that a lot of American women are facing today. What we know is that some of the choices that are available to women are a direct result of clinical trials. We know that if you're a woman with a localized breast cancer, that you have options. You can either have a mastectomy where the whole breast is removed, or you can have a lumpectomy followed by radiation where just a smaller part of the breast is removed. We would never know that if we hadn't done clinical trials with thousands of women who participated in studies which compared those two approaches. So that's a great example in breast cancer where clinical trials made a difference. Another great example is chronic leukemia. We know the drug Gleevec makes a huge difference for men and women who've got chronic myelogenous leukemia. If it wasn't for people who went on a clinical trial of Gleevec, we would never have that drug available for patients. So there's no doubt in my mind that the progress in the new treatments that are coming down the pike will only come from good clinical trials. I think one of the big questions I get asked from patients is, what about the relationship between pharmaceutical companies and, and uh, clinical trials? And the way I like to look at it is that in the vast majority of cases, and listen, 5% of, of things can be done poorly, but 95% of the time, the pharmaceutical company's interest is the same interest as the patient. The pharmaceutical company wants to find out if their drug helps people, because if their drug helps people, they'll be able to put a drug on a market that will uh, be a good business decision for them as well. And if their drug doesn't help people, they need to know that as well too, because they're not gonna put the expense in developing it and the potential liability and risk if it turns out not to be a good agent down the road. So the vast majority of times, now obviously not every time, and there clearly have been some exceptions, but the vast majority of times, the pharmaceutical uh, company, the physician and the patient have complete alignment of interests to try to find the right answer as to whether or not the, the drug works. What's a shame is there have been some notable exceptions to that that have led people to be appropriately skeptical. But in my mind, and particularly in cancer, the alignment between the pharmaceutical industry and the patient, I think is very strong. Everyone wants better treatments and nobody benefits if an ineffective drug makes it to market. The most encouraging news we have on breaking the code of cancer is the revolution in genomics. Now, what is genomics? Genomics is the ability to take a patient's cancer and look and determine what the DNA sequence of the genes in that cancer is. That's something we could only have dreamed of years ago. We now, today, are able to offer that to patients to figure out which genes are abnormal within their cell. And if we know which genes are abnormal, this can lead us to develop better drugs to target those abnormal genes. And this is something which was a pipe dream three years ago. I didn't say 30 years ago, I said three years ago. And the, the revolution in genetics that's allowed us to do that is extraordinary. And it's why I'm very hopeful that we're gonna come up with better medicines and better treatments for cancer.